The student who came to her family for the holiday went for a run and disappeared without a trace. The inhabitants of a small village were shocked by this event because nothing like this has ever happened in their region. The detectives began an investigation that lasted for years. It was only after 28 years that the villagers of a small village learned the terrible truth. Before starting the video, be sure to subscribe to the channel. It is very important. Mandy Stavik was born on April 16, 1971 in Bellingham, Washington, U.S. She grew up in a large family. She had loving parents, two brothers and a sister. Shortly after Mandy's birth, her parents decided to move to a town called Palmer in Alaska. This place was distinguished by the picturesque nature, safety and cohesion of the local inhabitants, who were there only a few thousand. The family lived in this city for several years. When Mandy was three years old, her parents decided to divorce and the girl stayed with her mother. However, she continued to see her father almost every day. A year later, Mandy's 17-year-old brother went hunting and disappeared. Police soon found his body, which contained almost 20 bullet wounds. Despite all the investigators' efforts to solve the case, they could not find any suspects. It was a shock for Mandy and her family. Despite this, she grew up cheerful and active. She studied perfectly, practiced many sports, and played various musical instruments. When Mandy was 12, her mom decided to move back to Washington, but this time in a small village called Acme. Its population in those years was less than 300 people, and all the inhabitants knew each other well. There were almost no serious crimes in the area, and the woman decided that she and her three children would be better off here. Mandy went to a local school where she quickly made friends. She went on to play sports, joined a school music group, and became a cheerleader. In addition, the girl was delighted with the local nature and loved to go jogging towards the picturesque river. When Mandy was 17, a new tragedy occurred in the family. After the divorce from her mother, the girl's father stayed in Palmer and started a new family. He had several children, and in 1988, Mandy's half-brother drowned in the river. This was another shock for her, as well as a reminder of her older brother's death. After graduating from high school in 1989, Mandy enrolled at Central Washington University, three hours from her home. She wanted to be an airplane pilot and wanted to study only perfectly. She took up residence in a university dormitory, but at every opportunity tried to visit her family. At the end of November, she came home to spend Thanksgiving with her relatives, and she planned to stay there for a few more days. On November 24, the day after the party, Mandy decided to go for a run. Usually, her mother kept her company and rode beside her on a bike. But this time, the woman stayed at home because her sister came to her for a while. Mandy then went alone, taking the family German Shepherd with her. Her usual route started at home and ran along the road to the river. The girl then turned and ran back. In total, it was about 5 km. It usually took less than an hour to run, but this time, the girl was clearly delayed. When her brother came home, he was surprised that Mandy was still gone. The young man was visiting a friend whose house was located along the road. The brother saw his sister running back towards the house and a few minutes later running backwards. Then he thought the girl had decided to make another lap. But even so, she had to come home much sooner than he had. As time passed, Mandy's family began to worry about her. Aside from never having run so long before, the girl had plans for the evening. Before going home to the party, she invited her roommate to come with her. On that day, they were going to the next town to meet their friends. Two hours later, something happened that made the whole family even more nervous. Their shepherd returned home without Mandy, which was very strange. The mother of a girl who had already lost a child once decided to go immediately to the police. Despite the fact that Mandy was 18 years old, the sheriff agreed to begin the search immediately after the woman called. Meanwhile, the mother started calling all the villagers and asking if they had seen her daughter. After hearing that Mandy was missing, many of them went outside and quickly organized their own search. Together with the girl's relatives, they traveled several times along the route that she ran on, but it was not possible to find her. Meanwhile, the police began interviewing people close to Mandy. They found out that the girl had a name named Ricky that she had dated since high school. At the same time, the girl's mother said that the couple had broken up 
and was getting back together. The investigators spoke to him, but found no reason to suspect the boy. They interviewed several other people while searching the area with the villagers. By then, the search had been joined by men in Sioux, horses and helicopters. The local dog handler even tried to work with the shepherd, hoping she'd lead them to Mandy. However, the dog was clearly frightened and did not want to leave the porch of his house. The search continued into the night, but nothing came of it. The next day, they continued and the police were able to find the first disturbing clue. On one of the country roads, volunteers found women's sweatpants. They were covered with dirt and looked old and had several holes. The pants immediately showed Mandy's mother, but she doubted that they belonged to her daughter. Despite this, the police still sent them to the lab. Experts found traces of male semen on them. The detectives immediately requested DNA samples from all the men who knew Mandy and were in the area. However, no matches were found. The FBI's common DNA database for convicted felons was not available that year. Therefore, investigators could not do anything with this evidence. Meanwhile, specialists with search dogs began to participate in the search and soon they found a new clue. They managed to find traces of the girl on a dirt road as well as traces of her shepherd and there was one strange moment. Their tracks were interrupted in the same place. There was only one conclusion. Mandy had to get into someone's car. The detectives admitted that the girl might have been abducted and forced into a car. However, experts refuted this assumption. In this case, at the site of the trail would be a completely different picture as the girl had to give some resistance. In fact, it looked as if she had gotten into the car of her own free will, which means someone she knew could have been driving it. On the third day of the search, the policeman, together with the fire department, began to comb the local river, which ran near the road on which the girl ran. And there they were waiting for an alarming discovery. About five kilometers from the village, downstream, they noticed a woman's body in the water. When they got it out of the water, they knew Mandy was dead. There were no clothes on her body, except socks and sneakers. The police also saw no serious injuries, except for a few large scratches on the legs. They began to wonder whether the girl could have drowned. However, this version made no sense. First, the yard was late November, and the water in the river was very cold. Mandy obviously didn't go in there voluntarily, especially not without her clothes on. In addition, the depth of the river in that place was significantly lower than human height, and the girl could have calmly stood there. Medical examiners examined the victim's body and found an injury on her head, most likely caused by a violent blow. However, they determined that this injury could not have caused death. In the end, experts concluded that the girl died of suffocation in the water. In other words, she drowned. In addition, medical experts found that the girl had been assaulted. They were able to extract the unsub's biological material as well as find male DNA under the victim's fingernails. On this basis, the police have constructed the most suitable version of the incident. Someone kidnapped Mandy on the road, dragged her into a car and drove her to the river. There, an unknown perpetrator assaulted her, after which the girls managed to escape. This was evidenced by scratches on the legs, which were highly likely to have been left behind by barbed vegetation growing along the riverbank. At some point, the perp caught up with Mandy, hit her in the head, and dumped her in the water. Forensics pulled a DNA profile and cross, referenced it with samples from everyone involved in this case. In total, they checked over 30 men, but no matches were found. The police continued to search for any leads, interviewing all the villagers and surrounding communities. Besides her brother Mandy, another Acme resident saw her in the den of disappearance. The man parked near his house and saw the girl running along the road. When she got out of sight, a dark pickup followed her. At the time, the man didn't think much of it, but after the murder, Mandy shared his observation with the police. He was unable to recall the model of the pickup and refused to provide the detectives with his DNA. This behavior seemed strange to them, and they got a court order ordering the man to give up his DNA. However, it did not match the sample found on the victim's body. The murder was heavily reported in the news, and in the first few months, the police received several thousand leads. Unfortunately, all of them were deadlocked, and as a result, 
The investigation dragged on for years. The detectives never managed to identify any serious suspects, although they continued to actively consider different candidates. At some point, investigators suggested that an unidentified maniac known as the Green River Killer might be behind the crime. He was suspected of killing dozens of girls, and most often he dumped the bodies of the victims in the rivers. However, no leads could be found for this version. Even when the maniac was caught and his identity became known, investigators were unable to link him to Mandy's murder. With no evidence and no new suspects, this case has been on hold for years. From time to time, detectives took him out of the archives, trying to find some fresh ideas. But all this did not bring any result. In 2009, 20 years after Mandy's death, a new local police detective reopened the investigation. Given that no new evidence has come to light in the past two decades, he's decided to go the other way. Together with colleagues, they went around the village and nearby towns, asking every male resident to give a DNA sample. The investigator's plan was quite simple. He understood that the person who killed Mandy was probably a local. If you take DNA samples from literally every man, there's a decent chance you can find a criminal among them. And given that only a few hundred men lived in the village and its surroundings, this task seemed quite simple. But in practice, it seemed much more complicated. It took the police four years to check all the men. And in the end, they didn't get any hits. In doing so, the detectives realized that in 20 years, the killer could have moved anywhere or even died. So they started digging up archives and trying to track down literally every man who lived in that area at the time of 89. In 2013, the police received a surprise tip. Two women who grew up in the same village as Mandy went to the water park with their children. After talking, they remembered the high-profile murder and started talking about it. At one point, one of the women said she had an idea who might have killed Mandy. The other said that she also suspected one particular person. And they said the same name together, Timothy Bass. At the time of the murder, he was 21 years old, and the guy lived in only a few houses from the victim. The women were shocked to see that all along they suspected the same person. But what was more interesting was why they thought Timothy was the criminal. One of the women told me that the guy molested her as a teenager. One day, as he and Timothy and other friends were driving around in the car, the young man began to work very hard to win her favor and spread his arm. At that moment, the other friends intervened and since then, the girl has seriously feared being near this man. The second woman's story was even more shocking. A few years after Mandy's murder, she lived with her husband and their newborn child. Later that evening, while her husband was at work, Timati knocked on her door. The woman was not surprised by his visit, as he and her husband were friends. The man said he was driving by after the hunt and he needed to use the phone. The woman let him in, but then Timothy started acting weird. Instead of making a call, he stood there with the pipe in his hand, then he put it down. He then began to tell the woman that he had been in love with her for a long time and asked her to have sex with him. She refused and asked him to leave. However, Timati continued to insist very aggressively. The woman then threatened to call the police and only then he left their house. After sharing these stories, they decided to go to the police together and talk about suspicions about Tamati. When asked why they waited so many years, the women answered that they were not sure of his involvement in the murder. In such a small community, they would never be forgiven if they were accused of killing an innocent man. Therefore, none of them dared to share this information. Detectives immediately became interested in this man and immediately noticed something interesting. During the initial investigation, none of their colleagues interviewed Timothy and asked him for a DNA sample. It was very strange. The young man did not appear in any of the old police reports. Although he knew the victim, he lived nearby and his house was right next to the road. The girl ran down. The investigators also discovered that Mandy was friends with his younger brother Tom. Another suspicious development was that Timati moved to another town less than two months after the murder. Maybe that's why the guy was left out of the police sight. At that time, 
They were loaded with a huge amount of tips and background checks on people who volunteered to work with them. Timati settled in Everson, 40 Cam, from his old home. Shortly before moving, he married and eventually had three children. After discovering his criminal history, the detectives found another disturbing fact. In 2010, his wife filed a police report that Timothy had beaten her and their children. But most of all, the investigators were surprised by one small detail contained in this statement. In it, his wife described why Timothy was a danger to their family. Among the domestic violence stories, she briefly mentioned her husband's strange behavior while watching crime documentaries. When they watched such shows together, Tamati constantly criticized the criminals for how skillfully they commit murders, leaving behind a lot of evidence. The man also liked to say that he himself would never make the same mistakes and would not be caught. After studying all this information, the detectives began to think seriously about his involvement in Mandy's murder. They went to his house to ask him a series of questions and ask him to volunteer a DNA sample. This is where the fun started. Timothy stated that he did not remember the crime and could not even remember who Mandy Stavik was. Such a statement immediately caused the detectives to doubt his word. First, all the inhabitants of this village of less than 300 people knew each other. Secondly, Timati lived in only a few houses from the Stavik family and it was simply impossible that he would not know her. Moreover, since the murder, the case has been discussed not only in the village itself, but in all neighboring towns. It was the first crime of its kind in that area in years, and for the locals, it was the number one story for months. As a result, the detectives did not take the man at his word. They asked him to provide a DNA sample, but Tamati refused, which made him even more suspicious. Unfortunately, they had absolutely no evidence to link him to the murder. For this reason, the investigators could not get a court order that would oblige the man to surrender his name. Then they decided to go the other way. The detectives discovered that Timati had worked as a courier for many years in a bakery located in a nearby town. They went there and talked to the manager of the establishment, asking for information about Timati's routes for the next few days. The police planned to track him down and get something that a man could have left his DNA on. They didn't tell the manager exactly what crime their employee was suspected of. The detectives just said he was under investigation. However, the woman refused to provide this information without permission from her superiors. The police contacted them and they demanded a court order. The investigators were thus again deadlocked. They continued to investigate Tamati's biography and to try to come up with new leads that would enable them to obtain the much needed court decision. But all their attempts were to no avail and the case was frozen for a few more years. In 2015, they went to his home again, asked him a few questions and asked him for a DNA sample. But he again refused. This continued until 2017 when something unexpected happened. A woman named Kim Wagner who was the manager of the bakery, went to a bar with her husband and friend. In the past, they all lived in Acme, and at the time of Mandy's murder, Kim was only a year older than her. At some point, they talked about this case, which has haunted the minds of the local people for decades. Suddenly, one of the friends mentioned Timothy Bass, who lived near the victim's house, and then the woman came to her senses. When the police came to her office and asked for information about his itinerary, she did not even think that it could be connected to the murder of Mandy Stavik, and then Kim wondered if her employee was the killer. That thought had been with her for a long time. And at some point, the detectives came back to her work. They had hoped that, since their previous conversation, the woman had changed her mind and that hope had been justified. Kim invited the investigators into her office and asked them directly if they suspected Timothy of Mandy's murder. Timothy was a suspect. The police were surprised but did not deny it. Then the woman gave them all the necessary information and also shared interesting observations about her colleague. She knew a man for years and always thought he was strange. When one of her friends mentioned that Bass lived near Menzies' house at the time, she began to think seriously about his involvement. So I decided to help the investigators. Detectives began to follow Tumati and here they found new difficulties. 
While working, the man always wore gloves so that experts could not take a sample of his DNA from the objects he touched. The man didn't smoke either, so the cops couldn't even get a cigarette bite with his saliva. Fast didn't even have a job at the bakery itself because he worked exclusively on the delivery of the produce. In addition, another strange fact complicated the task of the investigator. Timati never threw out garbage at work. He was packing his van, then driving him home. The man also did not hand in his uniform for washing, as did absolutely all other workers. The detectives immediately realized that such behavior could not be a coincidence. Apparently, Timothy realized the police suspected him of killing Mandy, and he began to make sure that they didn't get their hands on any object that could be used to take his DNA. But in the end, the detective was lucky. Upon learning that they never managed to get the suspect's biological material, Kim volunteered to help. Laws work in such a way that police officers have no right to ask outsiders to get evidence for them. In this case, they simply will not accept in court, even if the guilt of the suspect will be obvious. However, if any person voluntarily gave them that evidence, investigators had the right to accept and use it. So Kim volunteered to retrieve something with basic DNA and the detectives waited. The suspect was very neat and the woman had long failed to achieve her goal. It was only three months later that she saw a man drink a Coke from a plastic cup and then throw it in the trash with a can. Kim waited for Timothy to leave, retrieved both evidence and handed it to the police. They immediately sent the jar with a glass to the lab and forensics pulled Bassinet profile from it. It's a perfect match for the biological material found on Mandy's body. After receiving much awaited evidence, the police immediately went after the man and arrested him. 28 years after the murder, the suspect was finally charged. During the interrogation, Timati denied his guilt until the investigators told him about the DNA match. Upon hearing this, the man immediately changed his story and said that he and Mandy had a secret affair. They allegedly began dating months before her murder and were forced to hide this relationship from everyone because the girl had a boyfriend. According to Timothy, on the day of her death, Mandy went to his house during her run. They had an intimate relationship and the girl left. He added that his father was in the house at the time. However, it was impossible to use him as a witness since the man had died long ago. The detectives never believed the story. In their opinion, Timothy fabricated the whole secret affair story to explain his DNA on the victim's body. He also referred to his late father, who simply could not deny the information. Investigators talked to Mandy's family and friends, and they all expressed full confidence that the girl would never date Timothy. He was very strange. He stayed away from other people and spent most of his time alone. Detectives decided to talk to his wife. Despite the fact that the woman wrote her husband's statement and lived separately, they were still married. Another interesting turn was waiting for the police. The woman suddenly said that she was with Timothy at his house the day Mandy was killed and the guy was there all day. The detectives did not believe her story, but the woman's words created possible difficulties for the trial. On the other hand, they contradicted Timothy's version that on the day of the murder, Mandy went to his house and had an intimate relationship with him. The trial began in May 2019. Timati's lawyer continued to insist that his client was innocent and that his DNA had entered the victim's body as a result of a consensual sexual encounter. The prosecution insisted that there was no one to corroborate this theory. Timati never called Mandy, wrote her notes or letters, and no witness interviewed saw them together. It was much more likely that Bass was unilaterally attracted to the girl and even obsessed with her. Investigators discovered that the guy started attending all the sports games when Mandy joined the school team. Up to this point, he showed absolutely no interest in sports. In addition, his windows looked directly at the road on which the girl ran, and he could watch her running. Apparently, that day he decided to talk to her and caught up with her. Perhaps the guy began to molest, but the girl fought back. Or he convinced her to get in her car on some pretext. Bass then took her to a deserted place, abused her, and the girl managed to escape. The guy caught up with her near the riverbank 
hit her in the head with some kind of object and dumped the body in the water. Timati's wife, who had already divorced him, testifies at the trial. This time, she surprised everyone again. Instead of sticking to her original story, the woman gave a new story. According to her, she did not remember that she was at Timati's house on the day of the murder. The woman added that Bass had forced her to lie to the police during the first interrogation, otherwise he could go to prison. At the time, she was seriously concerned that her husband might harm her or her children. So she agreed to lie to the police. This deprived the suspect of his only alibi. But then the court heard something else interesting. Tom, the suspect's younger brother, said that after Timothy was asked for a DNA sample, he began to feel bad about it. When Tom asked him what was going on, his brother told him the same story about his secret affair with the victim. Timothy also asked him to tell the police that he too had had sexual relations with Mandy, but Tom refused to lie. Even Timothy's own mother testified against him. When the woman came to visit her son in prison, he handed her a note asking her to lie to the police. The son asked the woman to say that on the day of the murder, he went to the store with her for Christmas presents but the mother refused to lie. In the note, Timati also asked her to testify against her own father and try to convince the investigators that he was the real killer. After all this, the defendant's lawyer tried to convince the jury that Timati's DNA was obtained illegal. He insisted that the police asked a civilian to get the man's biological material for them, circumventing the rules. However, Kim Wagner denied these allegations and said that she offered to help the police. In 1989, the murder shocked her and she continued to think about him regularly for decades. Upon learning that her colleague was a suspect, the woman wanted to help solve the case. Besides, she already had a daughter by then and Kim could hardly imagine how Mandy's mother felt at that time. The trial lasted several weeks and after all, the evidence was presented the jury found to Marty Bass guilty of murder. The man was sentenced to 27 years in prison with the possibility of applying for early release after 24 years. Mandy's mother, who was 83 at the time, thanked the detectives for their work. Although she lost two children in her life, she was still glad that the guilty party was punished. In 1990, Mandy's family established a scholarship after her in high school where she attended. They continue to support the program to this day annually rewarding the most gifted students who do music. The scholarship was based on $25,000 collected by the residents of Arkme and other settlements. Initially, the money was offered as a reward for information, but after the case was solved, it was decided to use it for the program. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and do not forget to like under this video. I recommend you to subscribe to our channel where we often publish the most interesting criminal news from around the world. Thank you for watching 